Thank you, Scott. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and it was very exciting to hear uh, all these talks yesterday, and, and it's actually a very good um, segue into the presentation today. <clears throat> Just let me... So this is about big data in climate, and of course you have been hearing a lot about what big data is in climate. <clears throat> uh, this is all about yesterday's talk. You saw the challenge uh, talk yesterday afternoon from Mike Wiener. You see that the uh, animation of uh, precipitable water uh, getting more and more accurate. Uh, you see uh, animations of NASA satellites circling the Earth. And between these, um, uh, massive amount of data is being generated, especially with things like CubeSat and, and Sentinel and other high resolution satellites. You're talking about petabytes of data every day being collected. So um, it, it really offers a huge opportunity um, uh, for computer scientists to be involved in this problem of, of, of uh, our generation um, um, beyond providing faster computers, which we have been, and, and these simulations won't be enabled uh, uh, without the fast uh, computers, the computers that have become faster over the, uh, the five decades, but also um, about other technologies, and you heard quite a bit about the, uh, the communication and, and, and workflow technologies yesterday. Uh, and, and, and my focus is going to be what machine learning, data mining uh, side of it can, can do today. And the recognition of all of these components of um, computer science is sort of being recognized not just by people in our field, but also in the computer climate sciences, because this is sort of a quote from Nature Climate Change uh, editorial uh, on October 2012, that climate change research is now big science comparable in magnitude, complexity, and importance to human genomics. And those of you might remember, in the 80s, in the 1980s, about 30 years ago, people were having very similar discussion about biology being headed towards computing. And of course, um, and we are uh, hoping to see the same kind of transition in, in climate and earth sciences today. So Scott talked about this project, uh, the expedition project on understanding climate change. It's a project that involves five different universities. Um, half the team is computer scientists, uh, mostly focused on machine learning and high performance computing. And the other half is, is people uh, from disciplines like civil engineering, uh, environmental sciences, remote sensing, uh, and, 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 and so forth. And this project, of course, has led to a whole uh, bunch of work over the, the period of time. And and this is just a brief highlight of some of the, uh, the key results and uh, or key direction that have been pursued. Uh, Michael Wiener's talk yesterday afternoon uh, was about taking this massive amount of data coming out of the climate models and, and, and possibly reanalysis products like MERA and others. And, and it turns out that you can take those um, uh, data sets, which are really space-time data sets, and then convert them into networks uh, where each region on the, in the physical space becomes a node and the edges begin, between them become relationships, depending on how you define the relationships of your interest. And once you bring it to the network domain, then a whole bunch of techniques that machine learners, computer scientists have been inventing and developing and, and exploring and perfecting in the domain of social networking, you know, dealing with the Facebook data, the e-commerce, and everything that become available, and, and, and it leads to some very, it has left some very exciting results. A, a series of papers in Journal of Climate, the top Journal of Climate, where the results coming out of this kind of analysis led to um, discovery of entirely new, previously unknown climate phenomena. One of the talks from Stephen Lee this this afternoon would be on one of those results. So there are a series of such results, and then what is exciting about computer science machine learning research is that when you develop these new methods, they actually can go far beyond the application domains of interest. So the same methods literally taken out and applied to the brain fMRI data, which, is also generate, which also generates amazingly similar space-time data sets as climate models. Uh, you can discover new patterns there as well. Um, uh, there is a piece of work on sparse predictive modeling. Uh, there was a lot of talk about deep learning yesterday, for example, which is very exciting because if you have lots of labels, um, you can make uh, many of these black box models work very, very well. But in many of the formulations of climate science problems, not all, but many of them, 
Uh, we have massive amount of data, but not of the kind that you need for training uh, in the sense that you may have a um, huge number of data at high resolution in, in space and time uh, over the climate for hundreds of years, but the ground truth that can be trusted may be available only for a few decades, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe at most 100 years, depending upon the kind of data you're looking at, which means the verifiable samples that you can use is, is of the order of a few dozen or a few hundred, whereas the variables that you have are like thousands or millions or, or, or more. And then how do you work in the situation where it's, it's exactly the opposite of what you would sort of face in deep learning where you have small number of features and large number of variables, large number of samples. We're flipping this problem here. And, and, and how do you manage that? And again, there have been work in the group on sparse predictive modeling. Um, nature of extremes is extremely important. What is of concerning to society is not one or two degrees change in the temperature, but, or a few degrees change in temperature, but the extremes that sort of result from that. Some of you might have read the, uh, the news story this, this morning, that, uh, which is sort of confirming a, a series of results over the last five, six years. That is, with the cl changing climate, the more the wet areas will get more wet, and the dry areas will get more dry. And the, the very first study in this sequence was the, which came out of this project, highlighted by NSF back in 2011, December, which sort of showed, showed the same kind of controversy being uh, uh, addressed in the Indian subcontinent. There were a series of science papers uh, saying, well, what, what has a changing climate over the last three decades has done for the monsoon in South Asia, uh, India, and others. And one paper sort of said, well, the, the uh, rainfall is going down. Others said, no, 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 it's going up. So there was a lot of uh, 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 controversy about what, what's really happening. And this, this paper from our uh, project basically showed in uh, about five years ago that we cannot, given the trends we have seen in the last 30 years, we cannot make any assessment of whether the average rainfall is going up or going down. But what we can say is the spatio-temporal distributions of the extremes is changing in, in, in the wrong direction. And again, we have had that result sort of repeated over Europe, over America, and again, this most recent study, I guess, talks about the entire world uh, from a different group. So the, basically, these are the sort of kind of things that are uh, um, uh, some of the highlights of the result. There is a, on the top left corner, there is this um, uh, piece of work. I put it in because of the Scripps Institute here. Uh, you can take the data from the altimetry, uh, which is very coarse and very, um, uh, and very limited in, 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 in quality. And you can use that to then build the history of the eddies in the ocean going back many decades. And this was the first work of this kind software uh, produced uh, to, to build these eddies and then the data sets and became part of the Nature's Climate Change, Nature's Scientific Report Journal, which sort of makes it available to uh, people worldwide. I'm going to talk a lot more about uh, some of the work on change detection and monitoring disturbances in the ecosystems, which actually is a very good continuation of the panel from yesterday evening, the, the, the Big Pixel Initiative. It's almost like uh, that initiative is addressing pretty much the same kind of problems that, that I'm going to talk about here. So these are, of course, very exciting set of problems. Uh, and, and as you know, big data has, uh, technology has revolutionized the way we, we do many things in our life. But a lot of that work that we do in our community don't really directly apply to many of these problems in art sciences because the data happens to be uh, at multiple resolutions and multiple scales, huge variability in space and time. Uh, the models that would work, as to take the example from yesterday, would work for Mumbai, may not work for Sao Paulo, the uh, huge amount of heterogeneity, and uh, the training set labels that uh, are so critical for anything we do in machine learning uh, can be very hard to get by in, 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 many, in many of these uh, data sets. So uh, this, of course, pervade, many of these challenges pervade uh, lots of the work that we do in art science. And I'm just going to illustrate some of them, but in the context of monitoring uh, the art system. So this is a very small subset of what goes on in this project. It's all about uh, the rest, rest of my talk is going to be about data collected uh, uh, from the observations of the surface of the Earth from the satellites, remote sensing data. What you're seeing here is the animation of uh, yeah, MODIS circling the Earth. And of course, uh, many of you uh, are 
deeply familiar with this, this kind of data. But those of you who are not, this is, this is the satellite, this is a sensor on the satellite Terra and Aqua, which literally takes picture of every single location on the globe every single day. So every one of us is being pictured you know, in, in a very coarse sense every single day once, at least once. Uh, and once you have this data, then you can create mosaics out of the spatial mosaics, and you sort of see that in the, in the next thing. And then you can see them on, on, a, on a, in a, you can see a spatial snapshot of greenness that you sort of you're seeing on a single day uh, um, that you're seeing on the, on the next oval. Or you can see, you can look at any given pixel and ask how has it been changing over a period of time, and you can sort of see a pixel um, um, in that I picked up. I was giving this talk in Beijing at the, uh, in the National Convention Center, uh, and I picked up the location of that uh, uh, center, and I sort of showed how was it green on, on different years, and you can see the vertical line showing the air annual boundaries. And that convention center was at the location of the Olympic Stadium. Uh, and, and of course, there was nothing before 2008 there, and, and, and then they sort of cleared that land, was agriculture land, cleared it, and built uh, the stadium. So the agriculture cycles went away. And if you go there today, it's beautiful you know, apartments, green areas, and you can see it's a little bit of green that's coming back, right? So again, the point is that you can, even from this very coarse data, you can uh, build histories of locations all over the world. But then MODIS is, of course, 17 years, so has been up for some more than 17 years. Landsat had been up for 40 years, which has different spatial temporal resolution. And you heard a lot yesterday about, from many, many different talks, about the variety of different sensors, especially the European Sentinel satellites uh, that literally have about a trillion pixel on the globe every day. You know, uh, uh, 12 different bands, uh, not every day, but every, every few days. And, and, and you're, you're literally collecting just from uh, one of these sources about parapets of data every day. And then you, you go on to the digital globe and, 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 and cube sets and so forth. So the, the, the idea is that there is so many different modalities uh, in space and time uh, and, and spectral features that are, 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 that are sort of collecting the data about the way we live and, and what we do on this earth. It's just absolutely uh, humongous and it creates a number of opportunities for our machine learning community. And I'm just gonna try to illustrate some of these opportunities and challenges and, and results in the context of, I just chose three you know, case studies, and they will, of course, have to be very quick, given the, uh, the sh short amount of time I have. But I'll try to sort of um, give you a sense of why these problems are important, why they're hard, and uh, what novel techniques uh, can bring to bear uh, to address them, and to what extent we have been able to address them. So the three uh, studies that I'm going to talk about uh, is one uh, for the mapping of fires in the forest, and of course, I don't have to tell people living in, in California as to why they're important. Uh, they are sort of uh, very personal to you, but in many ways, these forest fires are of great importance to the entire world because the, if you look at the amount of carbon lost in the degradation of these forests, uh, largely by fires, uh, by, by forest fires and related events, it, it amounts to roughly equivalent to the entire transportation sector. All the cars, trains, aeroplanes, ships, everything put together, the amount of energy that they, they, the fossil fuel they, they, they consume is about 15 to 20% of the total carbon budget, and it's roughly about the same amount of uh, carbon that we lose by these, uh, these events. So if you're able to, uh, to somehow uh, keep them intact uh, uh, where they need to be, not every place, but where they need to be, uh, we could, uh, as we move to the zero carbon future, we could get there. Uh, this, this, this would play a major, major role in getting us there. And everybody agrees on this, and then the question is, um, how do you take actions? How do you reward the communities? And, 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 and again, the, the monitoring and reporting and verification of these becomes extremely important. And, and a very related um, um, a problem is one of being able to see how the plantations are, are growing in, uh, in the tropical forest. Now you see this, the second graphic that you see on the, on the picture. You see this little green area with little tiny circles. And these are beautiful um, oil palm trees. 
Uh, and about 20 years ago, it seemed like a great idea to be able to plant them because you know, people became aware of the fact that we need to go on to renewable fuels uh, 20 years ago. And well, then why shouldn't we grow ethanol in the Midwest and, and, and maybe uh, uh, the oil palm wherever they can grow, especially tropical forests, there are lots of forests there. We replace them by the oil palm. We have this renewable supply of fuel. Uh, and, and pretty soon it became um, clear that what we're doing is actually an extreme damage to, uh, to the environment because the, um, the amount of carbon stored in the peat soil uh, in these forests is, is tremendous. Uh, and the, whatever we could possibly aim to gain by the uh, circling, the recycling of the, 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 uh, of, of the, the fossil fuel, I mean, the, the renewable uh, aspect of the fuel, it would take hundreds of years to recover that. And then we are in really big trouble in the short time. And because the oil palm and related products are used in everything that you see in your pantry uh, and food, so it's part of the food supply chain. And as a result, uh, most of the world's major corporations uh, have pro pledged to not buy any oil palm related products from an unsustainable uh, uh, forest. But then how do you know they're coming, what you buy is coming from where, right? So there was an article in The Economist just um, a, a few months ago where they're sort of lamenting about this problem that you know, you're building these plantations and how do you, do, how do you mentor them? So they were interviewing the, uh, the minister from Indonesia and the guy sort of said, well, somebody comes in and takes a permit for 10,000 acres and we have no idea that's whether they build the, the plantation on those 10,000 acres or much, much more because these are all uh, jungles. We have no way of verifying anything. <laughs> And they, once they have this plantation, they're supposed to cut the trees and then replace them by plantation. But the most easy thing to do is to burn them, slash and burn. And once the trees are burned, then you just clear them. And then, of course, you, uh, you have much easier time uh, building plantation, which is really, really bad for the environment, but really good for the person who is building the plantation. So how do you, um, uh, um, how, how do you sort of uh, tell a company which is, respond, which is ready to, to put their money where their mouth is as to where is the supply chain coming from. So all sorts of questions like this have to be answered. And then again, uh, so that's the second case study I'm going to talk about. And third one, of course, is going to be about the water. Again, no, you're no stranger to here in California. Um, and, and, but the larger goal of this project is to be able to map the water on the surface of the earth at a very high resolution on the entire globe using these machine learning approaches. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you as to how far we have gone into this. Right? So these are the three case studies. I'll, I'll sort of go through each of them rather quickly. Um, uh, but again, trying to emphasize the, uh, the machine learning challenges. The first one is about being able to, to map forest fires. It's a traditional machine learning problem of give me a training set, and I'll build a model. And indeed, there is a series of products from NASA uh, that sort of give you this monthly product. So there is this product called MCD64A1, which has been the state of the art until a few months ago. They replaced it by just a, a, a successor, but it's the same minor variations from one to the next. Uh, and, and it's the most extensively used global monitoring product. As I said, every month you can go to the website and download the, the new data for the previous month for the entire globe. And it's effectively a machine learning algorithm. It's a very complex machine learning algorithm. And, and I'll talk about why it's, yeah, and, but it's very limited. It, 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 does a, it does a fantastic job on, uh, on most of the world except in the tropics. So in the tropics, it just misses most of the fires, okay? Because it has been calibrated uh, in uh, areas where you can see the data, uh, where the, where it's easy to verify what are, what's going on, like places like North America, places like California, right? But in the tropics, it's usually very cloudy most of the days, and when the fires burn, they burn for months in a row, and then they create a lot of smoke, so it's very, very hard to see anything. So this, this product has very, very poor performance, and everybody knows that, in the sense that you can't use this for uh, monitoring the, the, uh, the forest fires in, 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 in the tropical belt. And, and, uh, so there is a concern, uh, every, this is a known information that this is a very limited product uh, for, for the tropics. So, well, if, how, how are we going to handle it? And let's sort of say, that, you know, as a computer scientist, you walk in and you sort of say, well, how do I build a predictive model for something like this? Well, it should be easy because I have all these satellites. They collect the data for each pixel on the globe every day uh, or at whatever temporal resolution. And the data comes with a whole bunch of spectral values. 
So those are the x, uh, uh, the spectral values, x i, x one. Again, it's a vector; it's not a single value, so it's a vector of uh, variables. And then all I need is a target label, which tells me whether the pixel is burnt or not burnt. And then how should we get that? Well, you know, if you look at the satellite image of any area, like for example for this one, and you can pretty much tell that this looks like a green area for most of the time, and a little piece here looks like brown, and if you are lucky, you may look at the older date and find it's all green, and on this current date, it's all brown. I mean, a piece of it is brown, and next, after a few months later, the heavy thing becomes green. It must be fire, because if it was something else that was looking brown, it won't come back uh, to greenness. So uh, one could imagine uh, going through reams of uh, satellite data, uh, images, and building a training set um, uh, like this. And once you have the training set, then you're set uh, to, to use your favorite algorithms uh, you know, from machine learning to be able to solve this problem. Except that we'll have to treat this problem as if I have no target labels for supervision. And why am I saying that we have to treat it like this? Because there are certain part of the world we have very good quality labels, like in California. And, and, and I would say the, the, the forest fires are tracked probably best uh, in the world in the state of California. You can go uh, every year or download a polygon, it will sort of tell you exactly which pixels burn uh, every year. And they do it for, for going back multiple decades. Canadians do a pretty decent job. There are many other states in the US that also have a pretty good uh, record of these, not all of the states. But in the rest of the world, the information is very, very spotty. In most places, they will just pick up the NASA's product and then and just show it uh, as it is, right? And th there are some countries that have produced their own internal product, but they're not verifiable, they're not very good quality. So, so there is a complete absence of target label because the model that you build in California would do a very poor job in, uh, in the tropics. And well, you sort of say, well, I don't have the ground truth for tropics. How do you know it's going to do a very poor job? Well, we picked up a model from California and tried it in Montana, where, where we have a pretty decent ground truth, and it does a very poor job there, right? And the model from Montana does a very poor job in California. But of course, Montana model does a very good job in Montana and so forth, right? So you know that these models cannot be so easily transferred if I am building a model like this. The NASA's product actually is much more sophisticated. It has a lot of adaptivity built into it, so it can still work on a global scale. So, but, but we're gonna give us a break, which is we're gonna assume that we have imperfect annotations available for the entire set of samples. Not just the training samples, but any, any pixel we know something imperfect. And I'm gonna sort of, t t and why would that be uh, possible here? Well, you know, you, talk, you heard about thermal anomaly, that is the active fire product, which is actually used very extensively in California for fighting forest fires, because it's a real-time product, and you sort of know on a given day, uh, a, a, a pixel is, it, is, is unduly warm or not, unduly hard or not. And, and, but that, that, that information about active fire is extremely inaccurate in the sense it's very good for fighting, uh, it's good enough for f fighting uh, fires in California. Uh, but it's very inaccurate because if it's cloudy, the satellite won't see it, or if the fire burned for a day and went away the next day, maybe the time the fire was burning, the satellite wasn't there. So it's both incomplete and inaccurate. But we're gonna assume that we have uh, 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 such a, 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 a target label. The second thing is that one of the, uh, one of the hardest aspects about uh, modeling uh, things like forest fires is that we, we are looking at a predictive model in which the target class is rare, relatively rare. You know, for example, uh, California has about 73,000 square kilometer of forested area, and year 2008 was one of the worst in the history uh, uh, from forest fire, with uh, experienced maximum amount of fire activity in, in the last decade or so. Uh, and and it, it, it burned about 2,000 square kilometers, which is a very, very large area, but yet a small fraction of, of the total number of forests. You know, we're thankful for that. And in many other years, you know, there'll be much less fire. And then if your classifier has 80% accuracy, you could be calling twice the amount, uh, uh, three times the amount of fire being burned uh, in 2008, in, even in a year in which there was no uh, fire activity. So, so basically, it, the accuracy becomes a very poor method to optimize, and you have to really uh, optimize things like precision and recall and do it intelligently so that you don't end up getting bad results. And the third thing, of course, is uh, how do you evaluate the performance of model when you don't even have perfect labels uh, in places like tropics? And, and again, that sort of creates a whole bunch of very interesting um, 
theoretical challenges as to given imperfect information, how do you figure out where you are and what, what you're doing, right? So, so there is a, a series of framework that has been, uh, there is a, a framework that has been developed uh, for b predictive modeling of, uh, uh, for rare target class using imperfect labels. I'm just gonna give you a glimpse of it just because of the shortage of time because uh, this will take a, a long time to, to sort of uh, talk about. And I'm only gonna talk about a small piece of it, but at, hopefully it'll give an idea as to uh, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what some of the technical um, um, aspects are of, of, of this solution. So first thing is, what are the imperfect labels? So if I am trying to build a, a predictive model, what I want is a training set, which would be is the two matrices that you see on the, on, on the, on the, on the, on the uh, screen here. What we would like to have is a left matrix in which I have samples, which are rows, and I have all of these samples with the last column being blue, which are the positive class, and the samples that are red, which are the negative class, okay? So you have a whole bunch of positive samples, whole bunch of negative samples, and for each one of them, you have spectral values, and then you can apply your favorite uh, algorithm to build uh, your classifier, which we don't have, okay? What we have instead is the, the matrix on the right side, okay? In which the sample, the, the target labels for the sample have been flipped. Okay? So alpha is the probability of flipping a blue label into red, and the beta is the probability of flipping a red label into blue. If alpha and beta were zero, the matrix would look like the left one, and if alpha and beta were very high, the matrix would look completely garbled. Okay? So, uh, so what, we, uh, what we're going to be working with is the right matrix on the right side. Okay? Uh, but we, uh, we assume that this, these imperfect labels are inexpensive to obtain. That means they're available for every single sample, uh, uh, no matter whether they're part of the training set or not. And some examples for the burnt area I gave you is thermal anomaly, the Actifier product. Uh, yesterday at the panel, they were talking about mapping of the urbanization, and you must have heard of the talk of nighttime light. Okay? It turns out nighttime light is a very inaccurate measure of urbanization, but accurate enough in the sense, in the sense that if there's a light, there's a likelihood that there is a, uh, a settlement there, but light diffuses so that it would diffuse to areas where there is no settlement, and then if you go to a poor village somewhere in Asia, maybe there's no light, and just yet people are living there, right? So, uh, so it's a, it's a in, it's, that's the kind of um, uh, imperfect label we're talking about. And I was giving this talk at CIR, the people who deal with the web, and then for them, it's like, well, if you're trying to predict somebody is gonna be interested in buying a product or not, well, you don't know whether somebody's gonna do it or not, but maybe we know something about their friends, and that's not an accurate measure, but could be an accurate measure. So the, the list goes on in, in the sense that you could come up with these kind of imperfect labels for many, many domains, not for all, but many domains, and if you do, then this paradigm becomes available modulo certain conditions are uh, applied. And just sort of, uh, give you a sense of how this kind of predictive modeling fit into the giant framework of machine learning, supervised learning, in which mostly you work on the left-hand side, expert anointed labels. You have lots of labels that are given to you uh, from the experts. Then you have sufficiently many training samples. Uh, so, so you have lots of good quality labels and plenty of them. And then you can use your favorite uh, machine learning algorithm, support vector machine, decision tree, logistic regression, deep learning, any, 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 any kind of, depending on how many you have. If you don't have enough of them, then there are other frameworks that have become available, semi-supervised learning, active learning, multi-view, and then so forth. But this is, the left branch is not what we are talking about, okay? Because we don't have perfect labels. What we have is imperfect labels, and that is a much less studied branch of machine learning. But even in that branch, uh, there is a subset that is studied very, very heavily, which is multiple annotators. You know, how many of you have heard of the Amazon Turk? Okay. Uh, some of you, at least. So this is a machinery. You could sort of go to Amazon and recruit a whole bunch of people for very little money because they're sitting all over the world doing perhaps uh, they have some free time. They're willing to work for very little money. And the people would use them for conducting experiments. They would sort of say, well, I'm trying to build a training set for images. Well, how do I build one? I can have my graduate students sit in the lab for, uh, uh, for a month, but that's very precious time. The student is very productive. Well, let's just go and, uh, and pay a few hundred dollars on the Amazon Turk, and then we can just recruit some random people and let them see some images and tell me whether it's a dog or a cat. And if I have enough of them, I could have a training set. But, but then how do you know those tra training sets that are produced are really good? 
because somebody is sitting somewhere for working for pennies and right, putting these labels. Uh, well, then that's where this whole machine learning framework has come up. That is, if you have multiple annotators, how do you make good sense out of them? Because you assume that these annotators are making errors randomly. So if they agree on something, that's more likely to be true as opposed to when they don't agree. And, and, and using that, people have built very sophisticated machinery to, to take to go from imperfect labels from multiple sources and build good labels that are much better quality. Right? We're not dealing with that. We are, we are, for the fire, I have Actify. That's the only annotator I have, which is imperfect. I wish I had more. Okay? So I have single annotator. And then once you go to that situation, the problem becomes much harder. There's a much smaller amount of work has been done uh, in, the, in the kind of partial supervision that you have. Some positive labels that you know for sure are positive, but the rest you have all unlabeled. That means effectively alpha is non-zero, but beta is zero. That is, no negatives have been corrupted, but only but a whole bunch of positives have been corrupted. Right? So, so this, this is the, the partial supervision branch, which, 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 which is, of course, interesting, but that's not what we have, because we have both errors in alpha and beta. The alpha and beta are both non-zero. And then there have been some work recently in the context of when these classes that you're looking for are balanced, in which case have been recent results uh, that have been very encouraging. And we don't have that. We have a rare class scenario. And it turns out that the, the development, uh, the, the method I'm going to show, and I'll talk about in just a few more minutes for, for very, very briefly, builds up on a whole bunch of these previous results and then uses them to take sort of the next step to build uh, this method for rare class. Uh, I'm just going to get my water bottle. So what are we looking at here is, uh, so basically, if, 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 if I say I'm going to build a model for you, a predictive model for you, uh, with imperfect labels, of course, if, I, if my labels are imperfect randomly, I mean, if, if they're, if they're, if they're uh, if, if they are made imperfect by an adversary, of course, you know, my model would be worth nothing. So I have to make some assumptions, right? And it turns out that people have been dealing, thinking about this problem for a very, very long time. And I sort of uh, showed you the right bunch of the tree from the previous case. So again, the problem is I have a left table, a table on the left, top left that I want. What I have is a table on the right, okay, which is corruptions have been made to the positives and to the negatives with probability alpha and beta. Now, I'm going to put some assumptions here. If the assumption is satisfied, then we can make some progress. So first assumption is alpha plus beta should be less than 1, which is actually a very, very mild assumption, because all it says is that the labels are not completely garbage. So that's actually not a very strong assumption at all. The second one is actually extremely important, that the imperfection in the label is conditionally independent of the feature space given the true label. That is even though the labels are incorrect, but they're not biased in the feature space. So if the, these are the two labels that you see on the top left, and, with these, and, and some of these have been corrupted, I've turned them into to red, the corruption is all over the space. It's a, it's a two-dimensional space, a very simple problem. And if the corruption happened to be like this, then it's not acceptable, right? So this is saying that uh, the imperfection should have some random nature to them. This is a very powerful assumption. <clears throat> And apparently, people were thinking about this assumption as far back as 20 years ago. Okay? So there's this paper, a completely theoretical paper by Blum and Mitchell, Colt, which is a theoretical conference uh, uh, um, uh, in 1998, uh, in which they sort of said, well, if I have the CCN assumption, L1 and 2, alpha plus beta is less than 1, and condition, CCN assumption con class conditions on noise, in that case, it must be possible to build a model. There was no. Uh, algorithm presented, but it, it is theoretically possible to build a model that would do as good on the right table as it would do on the left table, provided the table is huge, the table has sufficiently large samples. Okay? It is a theoretical proof, nothing constructive about it, and it turned out between 98 and 2013, and a whole bunch of results happened, and I'm, I'm skipping them just to keep the story short culminating in 2013 with, a very, with effectively the very first algorithm for this problem, okay, which sort of said, ah, if these conditions are true, I can just work with the right table and assume that I only have the imperfect label, treat them like perfect labels, and I can still build a model that will be almost as good as on the left table. Okay? Again, again, 
um, 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 uh, um, there was no proof, but it was like, hey, I'm doing it, and it's, uh, it's, it's working, right? In 2015, there was a paper in ICML which sort of actually theoretically showed as to why this really works. So this, so this was the first time somebody sort of showed that, yes, these are the regions, and again, there are some technical reasons as to why this happens. That is, I, under certain situations, I can really, really work with the, right, the labels on the right side, and it will give me this almost the same accuracy as on the right side, and this is how you, you're going to get it, right? Except that I am working in the imbalanced class situation where the maximizing accuracy gives me gives me no closer to the truth. And if I'm trying to maximize the accuracy, I can get, I can do horribly poorly in terms of being able to find the right kind of fires. So this is the problem that we are trying to, to, to address. And this is sort of, sort of in some sense, the, the break-even point. And we were working on this problem for the last three years. But as these results became available, we were able to build our story on top of these. And it, it turned out many of these results actually played a critical role in, in building the final solution. And I'm going to skip. Uh, some of them, just so that I can show you the results. This is a three-step algorithm. The step one is what I talked about. That is being able to build an algorithm, being able to build a predictive model, which will work with the imperfect labels, without having actually the perfect labels, and still give you a, a performance that you would measure in the rare class scenario, and, and would give you guarantees with some other minor assumptions that it will be about as good as, as the one with the, with the perfect label. Then the algorithm has multiple more steps uh, uh, to improve the result because the rare classes uh, are very difficult to handle, and I'm going to skip them uh, uh, for for the sake for the sake of time. But I just want to show you the results. Given that so analysis like this can be very hard to do, but for the state of California, I have the perfect labels. Okay, so I have a go the, the the diamond. Let's say the is the label is the the moniker for go uh, ground truth based classifier. So I build the classifier for the state of California. Take a random sample of data. And let's see how well does the classifier do. Well, it has this classifier perform for about 85% accuracy recall. That means it recalls 85% of the fires. But of the fires that it picks up, only about 30% are really fires. So remember, I have the ground truth. Okay? I'm able to build the model uh, using traditional uh, uh, algorithms. But the model is not going to have perfect accuracy, right? It has, it has some precision and some recall, right? It's a, it's a real class problem. It's not going to, if you look at the accuracy, it's going to be looking very, very good. But in terms of the recall and precision, this is how it looks. That it, a lot of the fire that it calls fire are really not fire. This is the best you can do with the, uh, 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 with, with the perfect label. Now the question is, if I had the active fire, the weak label, just by itself, what, how good it is. Now, the weak label itself is actually much worse than the ground truth. The ground truth is 100% recall, 100% precision. Makes no mistakes, finds all the fires. So weak label by itself picks up in California about 88% of the fires, and 45% of them are really correct, because it's always sunny in California, so the active fire does a very, very good job. So weak label by itself is pretty decent in California. But if I use this to build a classifier using the paradigm I talked about, and I gave you a very high-level summary of this, you get this uh, triangle, which is very, very close to the, the, the gold diamond, which is actually very, very good in the sense that you almost get as good quality results using this. But it's not good enough because if you're only getting, if you're, if you're only picking up 30% of the fires and then 80%, uh, if the fire that you pick up only 30% correct and 80% are being picked up, it's not good enough, which is where the second step of the algorithm comes in. I didn't talk about it. It reduce, improves the precision quite a bit. And then uh, the recall goes up. So you can see dramatically better results. Same thing for the state of Georgia, same thing for the state of Montana. And what I didn't put in this slide, but I, we have it in the paper that's in the ITP transactions on pattern analysis, which takes the same framework and applies it for urbanization mapping using nighttime light as the, as the weak label. And you get exact same kind of behavior that you're seeing here. So this, this, this is a, a, very, a very general framework. Now, <clears throat> Coming back to the tropics, because we didn't build a model to predict fires in California. The, the state of California only does a fantastic job. There is nothing we have to, uh, to bring to, to the table for that. The key question is, what happens in the tropics? Well, if you look at the tropics, Amazon, Africa, Indonesia, what's happening there? Well, there's this blue circle is what the MCD64A1 NASA state-of-the-art product says the locations burn. Many of them may not be correct. Many of them may be correct. Uh, and then if you look at the, the, uh, the framework that we built, 
it sort of has about three times as many fires. And then, of course, you can look at the fires that are common. Almost everything is good. Look at the fires outside. Nearly every, everything is good. And you can sort of see that these are the ones that we can build, we can bring to the, the community to sort of say, well, this is, this is where uh, the action is. And how do you know that what we're producing is, is actually good or not? Uh, I'm just going to give you an illustration because the paper has a lot more details on it. You look at the, this is the Amazon. If you look at the, uh, an area in, in the Amazon rainforest in 2002, it's all green, which means it's deep forest. You look at the same image in 2015, and you see lots of these white patches. These are all deforestations, okay? And on the right column, you see the detection of fires by our method, and you see these yellow and red dots. And all of those yellow and red dots, actually, if you look at them, match perfectly the mosaic in the middle column, okay? And, and I, I, I colored the dots into both yellow and red because yellow and red is the union of what we produce, and the red is what was produced by the NASA's product. So you can sort of see that the NASA's product was producing something very, very a small subset. There are many, many such areas where NASA's product would produce almost nothing. Okay? So this sort of tells you that, yes, uh, what we're producing is, is something reasonable. And its real utility is in the uh, context of mapping the plantations and dynamics. And, uh, and this is a hard problem for, for other reasons because it's hard to get weak labels here. Uh, and there are some labels available because when, the, when these different corporations announce that they are going to buy palm oil only from a sustainable uh, locations, uh, many nonprofit sprung up. There is an organization called Tree Plantation. Uh, actually, there's, there's an organization called Transparent World, which created this database of plantation in 2014. You see the top left box in there. And you look at that, and it turns out that it has, it covers quite a bit of plantations, but large number of them are not actually plantations. So it, it has a good coverage, but not very good recall, and it only has data for 2014. And then there's another organization called Roundtable and Sustainable uh, Palm Oil, RSPO. They produce three different data sets, one for 2001, one for 2005, one for 2009, people looking at their images and drawing things manually. And it's more accurate, but it's only available for three days, and it covers it doesn't cover a huge number of plantations. It has a very small coverage, and that has very large things. So basically, how do you handle these situations? And this is not just dealing with a weak label, because they, there is the plantations look different at different times. So we had to bring in some techniques from, from deep learning, long short memory uh, models to be able to solve this problem. And once we did that, now we have, for the first time, a dynamic map of plantations uh, in the entire Southeast Asia. You can see the red areas are the ones that were plantation as of 2001, and then each year after that, you can see the year uh, moving and the plantation growing in a very natural way. Okay? And you can sort of see yes, what the growth of this plantation is. Are they, statu are they sort of stopping or not? You can sort of tell for each pixel what happened. Now, what is the utility of this uh, in the context of being able to supply chain? You look at this map uh, in 2000. This is actually the current map uh, of all the plantations in this Kalimantan region in Indonesia, all of the green pixels. Right? So all of these are plantations as of now. And they were built on forest. Now, in the next slide, subset of these green has become red. So it's exactly the same as the previous slide, except some of these pixels are red. Okay? Red means these locations were burned before conversion to plantation. How, how would, do we know that? Because of the previous work. Okay? Now, you can see that almost more than half of these locations actually were burned. Right? That is, people just burn the trees and then change them into plantation. Now, this is half the crime. Look at this next one. The blue, you know what is this? These are all the trees that burn in the process of building those plantations. Because when you're burning an area, you have 10,000 acres plantation, you, you plan to build a plantation somewhere, you start a fire, the fire doesn't know the boundaries, it just spreads. So there are areas you can see uh, where the, you see a little bit of a red and a huge amount of blue right around it. That means somebody built a small plantation and they built, they basically damaged millions of acres of area around them. So this is, this is sort of, these are the kind of crime you want to be able to catch uh, using this technology. I only have a, just a little bit of time left, so I'll just very briefly talk about the third case study, which is being able to map the water on the surface of the earth. Some very exciting results here. Uh, we have the data from the remote sensing. We're going to use MODIS and Landsat. Uh, I can use it to classify every location, uh, water or land. And it turns out that we do have massive amount of training data 
from uh, available. In February of 2000, about 17 years ago, NASA flew a special mission of the space shuttle to map water on the Earth. There's another one coming up, SWAT mission, in, 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 in four years to again map the, the water on the Earth. So SRTM, the shuttle uh, uh, mission, gives you sort of what? At least on one date, how the water looked like on the, uh, on the Earth. So you have a massive amount of training data. So you might sort of think, well, this solved problem. I can now uh, work with it. It turns out that it's not, because the, the, the water looks very different. Water and land look very different in different parts of the world. This is, of course, the composites in the, in the uh, uh, visual composite, the, the fake composites. And you can see using the same way of mapping these spectral values into RGB, uh, a lake in Egypt looks very different than a lake in Ethiopia and a lake in uh, uh, nearby uh, uh, place. So, so that means the spectral signatures of water and land can be very, very different. I'm showing you an example of a lake in Argentina, which is the same lake on two different dates looks very different, right? And then this is, not the, this is not the only problem. The bigger problem is that lots of time the data is not available. So you see the animation of this lake, Poyang Lake, which is a large freshwater lake, feeds uh, uh, Beijing. And any time you see this orange, uh, the red orange color, the data is, data is missing. There's no data there, right? And you can see there are large swaths of time and there's absolutely no data. And of course, the problem becomes more serious for MODIS uh, for, for Landsat because its uh, coverage is, is every two weeks as well. So the question is, how do you do, how do you deal with the heterogeneity and missing data uh, and situations like this? And there are a whole bunch of technological solutions that have been developed. Uh, dealing uh, with heterogeneity using ensemble methods, but a, a very, very powerful machinery of being able to use the physical knowledge about how the water bodies are formed into mapping water bodies. That is, if I have, water bodies are always going to be in a bowl, and if a location A happens to be water, and your classifier is calling location B to be land, one of them is wrong, right? And then you can use this information to correct it. And if you had the location, the height information available globally at a good resolution, you are in, you're set. But it turns out that most of the world, you don't have that information. And the interesting problem then becomes one of how do you build a machine learning model that knows that elevation is important, but does not have the elevation information. So how do you use this implicitly to correct it? And it turns out you can do a fantastic job of that. And using that, we have sort of built the system. Z, I mean, you can access it. Anybody you know, can go uh, into the background, type this link and you will have access to the surface water uh, mapping on, on a globe. Right now, this is showing, this will show you mapping at the, at the modest scale, but pretty soon we're converting into Landsat scale. And the key highlight is you'll be able to see every single water body that's large enough, about 10 modest pixels, uh, detects melting of glacial lakes uh, around the world, changing the river morphologies, uh, building of river dams around the world, and all sorts of things. Uh, 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 relationship with under the, uh, the groundwater. And just to give you a sense of what these things are, I will, uh, so this, if you zoom in into the system and you went to the uh, North America, you will see like blue dots. Each blue dot is a water body. If you look at each one of them on a Google map, well, it's the Don Martin Dam in Mexico. If you look at the system, it will tell you how big this body was, how many pixels on 2000, and then it became very small in 2003, became big in 2005, and came down and, big, and so forth. Well, how do you know this is really happening? You can look at the Google time lapse to really see the variations. And you can look at some of these pixels and color them red if they're increasing over the last 17 years, or blue when they're decreasing, or green when they're decreasing. And you can sort of see that the certain part of the world have lots of green dots. Well, this is Argentina. And it turns out that the number of water bodies are really shrinking dramatically here uh, in the last few years, mostly because of agriculture use. And you can see any of them on the system, you know, uh, it sort of allows you to. Uh, check any of them directly uh, using time lapse. Uh, you can see a whole collection of red points in the Himalayas. Now, this is a very serious problem because there are a whole bunch of rivers that originate from, uh, from Tibet, which feed about two billion people in the world, okay? Uh, and these lakes are now increasing in size. And there have been all sorts of studies. People will take Landsat scenes and try to build what the lake sizes were in 1990 and what they are in 2005. But this is like a global study, right? And you can see each one of them dynamically. You can see a box like this, and you see all of the red areas. Those are the ones that increased. Another uh, red area uh, that you see that increased. And you can see the time lapse to sort of see how they're increasing. Another one, you can see how they're increasing. Uh, and you can collectively see as to how much new water has emerged, but about 
10,000 square kilometer in just, just a small box in the last uh, few years. And by combining it by altimetry data and other information, you can see as to how much water has been lost from these glaciers, right? You can see these red and green dots spread over uh, the uh, South America in, in a line. Of course, what's happening here is that the red and green dots are actually right next to each other, which means the rivers are meandering. Uh, and then you will see the river meandering actually in a minute. You can see, so basically this is the piece of work. Uh, John Schwenk is in the audience. He was a st student in Minnesota. His advisor came to us three years ago saying, hey, look, we study this river meanderings. Can you build machine learning models for it? And that sort of led into this project. So the, the paper that uh, on the river meandering, river Yokali, was published last year. But in the process, we have this uh, uh, global scale study of, of, of river meandering all over the world. Uh, you can see coastal erosions. Uh, but I'm going to skip it just to the time. You can see the building of dams all over the world. Uh, and the dams are so important to hydrologists, they have this data set called GRAN, uh, Global Reservoir and Dam Database. And it's it's based on self-reporting. So everybody sort of uh, tells you when they build a new dam, and these are the number of dams that they have locations since 2000, not very many. Uh, we're able to find about 100 times more just by using the system. So, and then not only that, we can tell what the dynamics is and then how they're changing and growing and shrinking. So, so basically this sort of gives you sort of a sense of what, how many different things you could do just with this modern monitoring. Uh, and one of the big, Exciting thing is being able to use this sort of sort of data to see how much river water flows through and how the river flow has been changing over a period of time because the river crosses national boundaries and, and, and sort of uh, uh, feed agriculture and 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 and, and, uh, and, and, and drinking water. So ba basically, there's a huge possibility of now being able to figure out how the the f water flow has been sort of going around. Uh, uh, and being able to do the same thing at land and scale allows us the possibility of calibrating hydrological models that are sort of used in many, many different ways. So with that, I'm just gonna stop just to sort of say that yes, big data techniques hold great promise uh, uh, for earth and climate and, uh, science. And, and a lot of this thing that I sort of uh, glossed over requires you to not just use traditional machine learning, but being able to combine them with uh, deeper understanding of the domain. And, and once you develop this method, they actually have applicability far, far beyond. So with that, I'm going to stop and take any questions. Thank you.